Okay, well, it's my great privilege to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Rick Adams, who I got to know, I've known for many years and have been out with him on field trips to see bats here in Boulder County. And um, he is Professor Emer Emeritus at UNC, University of Northern Colorado, and the founder and the president of the Colorado Bat Society. And I was on the board of the Bat Society for a few years and got to know Rick and his work very well. And uh, he certainly is uh, Mr. Colorado Bats. He and has also worked all over the world, including South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, China, Belize, and the Caribbeans. And um, he's done many classes and exposed many dozens of undergraduates and masters and doctoral students to the wonderful world of bats. I have one story to tell about. We went, I was out on a field trip with him up on the Mesa Trail. There's a pool up there that the bats come to after roosting all day to get water. They, they swoop down and, and um, grab mouthfuls of water. And uh, Rick had, was there and we were all with him and he reached up into a tree, the branch of a conifer tree. And in his hand appeared a bat. He had just carefully removed it from the branch of the tree because he had heard it squeaking. Bats do make audible sounds. And I always remember that, Rick. <laughs> it was just amazing to, and to see the bat up close. And then he um, does all kinds of studies on the bats with, I mean, nets them in, in uh, mist nets and then weighs them and checks them out for all kinds of species and health and uh, sex and all of that. So it's really fun. If you ever get a chance to go out with Rick on a field trip, then I highly recommend it. And um, he's going to talk to us tonight about bringing the natural history of Boulder County bats to light. I love that title. So Rick, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Carol. It's a wonderful introduction. Uh, should be going in the share screen here. So everybody should be able to see that. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> All right, well, uh, a few things I wanted to do tonight was uh, this spend a little bit of time just going over some of the basic facts about bats for anybody who perhaps is not initiated uh, into the, the bat world or hasn't heard uh, anyone, including me, speak about them before. Um, and then I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, viruses and bats. It's kind of a, a, a rabbit hole. So, um, it's uh, a complex situation, but uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of set the record straight from maybe what you see in, in the uh, uh, media on bats and viruses. Uh, and then talk about uh, some of the more recent findings we've had in, in Boulder County bats uh, over the past uh, few years and some sort of long-term data sets that we've analyzed and modeled to kind of look at bats and, and climate change. So just some uh, fun facts about bats. So, you know, if you're walking around and decide you just want to tell somebody about bats, these are some fun facts you can share with them. Uh, there's about uh, almost 1,400 species worldwide. And uh, if we put that in perspective of how many mammal species there are, uh, that's almost 25% of, of living mammals. So it's 5,200 species of, of mammals in the world. About 45% of those 5,200 are rodents. And so uh, between uh, bats and rodents, uh, you know, I like to tell people if you're a mammal living on earth today, uh, there's about a 70% chance that you're either a bat or a rat. Um, so, uh, bats make up a large diversity of mammals on Earth and they occur uh, globally. Uh, they have one of the most extreme physiologies of, of any mammals and their behaviors are quite unique from, from many other mammals, which we'll get into some tonight. 
Uh, but having a heart rate, a uh, metabolic rate of 1200 heartbeats a minute, uh, that it, uh, comes down to about 20 beats a second, uh, is extremely fast, almost unimaginable. Uh, it's right up there with, with hummingbirds. And because of that, they need to eat a tremendous amount of food. And this is one of the huge ecological services of bats is that they each eat their body weight in insects a night. And so um, even if you have a bat that weighs only about six grams, uh, if you actually weighed out six grams of mosquitoes, uh, that would be about 1,500 mosquitoes or so. Uh, and so they're voracious and uh, recycle a lot of nutrients and, and minerals and, and uh, water through ecosystems because of their consumptive rate. Uh, they use sonar calls, and we'll talk about this more in detail. This is called echolocation. Uh, and uh, the sonar calls of bats are extremely loud. They're above our hearing range, luckily, uh, because if you uh, put your ear about four inches away from a smoke detector and turn it on, uh, it's about 105 decibels and bat sonar calls are a little louder than that. Uh, they can use this uh, modality to fly in complete darkness and capture insects and navigate through the night. Although, as you can see by these pictures, they have uh, quite good eyes. They can see quite well, but light uh, eyes require light. And if there's no light, bats can navigate even better actually using sonar than they can with their eyes. Uh, so the last uh, fun fact is that most bats only have a single young per year. So they have a very low reproductive rate. Most of those young don't make it through the first year um, due to the hazards of learning to fly and catcher insects and that sort of thing. Uh, and bats can live uh, 40 years or more. So there are records of bats more than 40 years old. And in fact, a couple of summers ago, uh, Burton Stoner and I captured a bat, a little brown bat up on Shanahan Ridge that we had banded 18 years before. So bats are long lived and uh, have very few young in any given year, but over a lifetime can uh, certainly uh, pump out 20 young or so. Uh, bats first evolved, uh, we're not exactly sure, but um, it's thought to be around 60 to 65 million years ago, and that might ring a bell because that was uh, the time of the Cretaceous extinctions that took out the dinosaurs in about 76% of life on Earth. Uh, they're in the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing. Uh, and uh, we'll get into their hand wing uh, structure in just a little bit. Uh, they evolved from early insectivores, and these early insectivores actually lived with dinosaurs for about 180 million years. And after the dinosaurs went extinct, mammals radiated into a plethora of groups, one of which was bats. Um, the origin of bats uh, is thought to be North America, or at least Laurasian, the northern part of Gondwana land. Uh, uh, the northern part of um, you know, the Gawana land peninsula. Uh, and so Laurasia includes North America and also Europe and, and China, et cetera. Uh, and bats uh, are thought to have evolved either in North America, it's possible they evolved in, in Germany. Uh, the fossils are about uh, equally aged. Uh, but the oldest known full body bat fossil is actually from the Green River Formation in Wyoming. And this may be hard to imagine, but uh, Wyoming was tropical rainforest uh, a mere 52 million years ago. Um, so this bat is named Icaronicterus index. It's estimated to be about 52 million years old. Um, and again, it's a full body fossil. So as you see here, uh, it was a full bat at this point. And uh, actually it was capable of echolocation we could tell by the bones of the inner ear and the fossil uh, that they're specialized for echolocation as they are in echolocating bats today. So the first bats were tropical aerial pursuit insectivores, uh, and the largest majority of bats today uh, remain in that uh, trophic niche. Uh, there are two suborders of, of bats. There are big bats uh, called megacharopterans. Uh, and these are flying foxes. 
Uh, you may have seen these in Australia or Indonesia or, or if you've been to Africa. Um, and they're only distributed throughout the old world. Uh, there's about 250 species of them. And it's estimated that they evolved about 30 million years ago. They're generally larger in body size. Um, they are all fruit eaters and, and uh, seed dispersers, so they're very important to ecology. Uh, but overall, they have pretty low ecological and morphological diversity. They're kind of scale models of one another and tend to perform the same ecological services in the uh, habitats that exist. Um, they don't use ultrasonic lo uh, echolocation. There's one species that uses tongue clicks as echolocation to navigate through caves. Um, the largest have uh, up to six foot wingspans, so they can get quite large. Uh, and they fly visually for the most part. They have tricolor vision, so they can see diff three different um, colors. Uh, and uh, so navigation and color vision uh, by eyesight is how they get around and find, find food. Uh, the other suborder, microcrotherans, or small bats, are much more diverse. Uh, there are all types of morphologies and ecologies associated with this group. Um, they're globally distributed uh, they're on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, they have a much deeper evolutionary history, back to Icarinicterus index, so around 52 to 55 million years ago. It's about 1,100 species. Uh, they gen generally are smaller in body size, but some do get up to about four foot wingspans. Uh, diverse diets from insects to fruits to pollen, blood, fish, and other animals. Uh, they use highly evolved ultrasonic echolocation. Uh, and they have relatively smaller eyes, uh, and even though they have good vision. Um, uh, really, they prefer to navigate by sonar, uh, particularly when, as I mentioned, when it's dark. Um, all can see uh, black and white uh, vision, so they all have rods. Um, but some also have cones and can see dichromatic vision, so they can see in two wavelengths. Uh, the structure of bats, uh, the, particularly the wings, is what makes them so special, of course. And even though we kind of take flight for granted, mostly because we see birds every day and it seems kind of normal. Uh, if we really look at it from an evolutionary perspective, flight is extremely rare in vertebrate animals. Uh, the pterosaurs are an extinct group of reptiles that flew. Uh, birds and bats winged on into the present uh, and both have uh, independently evolved flight on very different types of wings. Uh, but both are with us today. Uh, and again, over 600 million years of time, there's only been these three groups of vertebrates. Um, the patagium has fine hairs for airflow detection across the wing, uh, which makes for a very dynamic wing surface. Uh, so the bats can actually tell wings, uh, wind speed across the wing surface. Uh, the, Flight membrane is elastic. It's supported by these highly elongated fingers, digits two through five. And this is uh, uh, why the, uh, they're in the order Chiroptera or hand wing. Uh, the thumb is left free, uh, which uh, allows for grooming and climbing. Uh, they can change the lift across the wing uh, very, very precisely by bending each finger at a different angle, uh, which makes them incredible acrobats when they're flying. They also have arteries coming out into the wings that um, allow them to shunt heat onto the surface and uh, evaporate that heat into the environment. So this is very important for keeping them cool. When you have a heart rate that high, it's easy to get overheated. So a little bit about uh, birds and bats and how they fly differently. Uh, birds use their pectoralis muscles, as you know, to generate uh, not only the upward anti-gravity force, but also the forward motion. And it's a really slick technique. It, uh, 
it almost seems actually physically kind of impossible to use the same muscles to generate uh, forces in two different directions. Uh, but they do it, and uh, by this mechanism of flight, uh, by using just the pectoralis muscles, it creates a very stable linear type of flight. Uh, this is very different than what we see in bats. Uh, bats fly much more erratically. Uh, their bodies are moving around a lot, uh, and that is because they're splitting the forces of flight uh, between the chest and the back muscles. So bats incorporate the back muscles, uh, not only the pectoralis muscles. So they flap down, uh, it keeps them up, and when they flap back, uh, it drives them forward. And so when they're doing this, the actual uh, body axis is moving back and forth. Uh, up and down as they're uh, flying through the air. So this kind of creates a, a more erratic looking flight. Uh, bats have solid wings, of course. Birds have feathers uh, and the bones are only in the leading edge of the wing. And these feathers are on uh, turnstiles. And so when the bird flaps down, uh, the feathers lock together and create a, a flat platform. When the bird flaps back, the feathers spin uh, on their turnstiles and allows air to go through the feathers so that they're not creating a downward force when they're uh, flapping uh, to the, into the upstroke, which would be pretty detrimental to flight. Uh, bats have a solid platform, so they have to do it quite differently. And one of the ways they do it is that they turn the hand wing part of their wing perpendicular to the ground on the upstroke and uh, therefore it does not catch air and then they flip it at the end of the upstroke and this flipping of the hand wing backwards is what drives them forward. So a bird kind of flaps up and down like this or has some sort of forward uh, clockwise rotation of the wings. Uh, bats do it actually in an opposite way. Um, this is a young bat that we did high speed video on. And if you watch how it flaps its wings, it's actually rotating counterclockwise. Uh, and as you see the wings flapping down to generate upward force and they come back and then this tip just kind of whips back. And when that tip of the wing whips back, this is what drives them forward. So it's a different mechanism uh, of flight uh, involving, again, both the chest and the back muscles. This keeps the bat's body very thin and allows them to crawl in the crevices and that uh, sort of natural history trait that protects them from predation. A few years ago, we found out that bats can also use their tail membrane um, for flight. And so particularly taking off from the ground, and again, this is high speed video at 600 frames a second. Um, uh, as the wings are flapping, the tail is flapping and it's actually flapping out of sync with the wings. When the wings reach the top of the upstroke, uh, the tail is coming down because when the wings reach the top of the upstroke, they're not creating any force for a fraction of a second. The, the tail membrane takes over and actually keeps generating forward motion. Um, and we've done this with a bunch of bats and you don't have to worry about all the physics crap here, but uh, what we see, here's one taking off in a flat trajectory off the ground Here's one at a little more of an angle, and here's one at a greater angle. And what you see is that as you go into a greater, greater angle, the wing flaps uh, get, uh, I'm sorry, the tail flaps get more and more intense. And you can see this red line, which is the tip of the tail versus the tip of the wing, which is in blue, again, moving in a counterclockwise rotation, uh, is out of phase with the flapping of the wings. Uh, and so this helps them under uh, sort of the strain of taking off or flying straight up. Um, 
to uh, be able to uh, do it most efficiently. Uh, echolocation is certainly one of the most spectacular uh, modalities as ever evolved. Certainly, there are other mammals that do this. They're actually shrews, and uh, uh, a recent paper came out on a dormouse, which climbs trees, which is blind, but uses echolocation to move around in branches. So uh, the more we study uh, mammals, the more we realize that a lot of them might be using uh, a type of echolocation. Those systems are quite primitive. And even in the cetaceans, such as the whales and dolphins, it's a series of clicks. It's a very simple uh, system of sonar that they're using. Bad echolocation is the most complex. Uh, it works on a simple principle that generating sound from the larynx goes out into the environment uh, and bounces back off of objects in the environment to the ears, and then the bat has to decipher it uh, using a very powerful auditory portion of the brain that can decipher these uh, sonar pulses and fractions of seconds. Um, as it turns out, um, uh, when bats are flying, of course, it's usually not a single item out there, right? The sonar is going out and um, bouncing off of all these different insects, as well as everything else in the environment, including other bats that are flying around. So it's a very complex system that they're using. Uh, a paper just came out, actually, that was just really interesting, uh, that uh, bats know the speed of sound at birth. In other words, it's, it's an ape. They did an experiment where they put helium in a chamber uh, and let bats fly around. And helium uh, changes, uh, essentially increases the uh, speed of sound uh, as opposed to uh, if it's, it's just oxygen and nitrogen. And so uh, what they did was put adult bats into this chamber and the bats, of course, couldn't catch the insects because they were misreading the, the uh, pulses coming back because the speed of sound was different in that chamber. Uh, as it turns out, of course, you know, they were thinking, well, these bats have learned uh, beforehand you know, how it should work. Uh, so what they did was they got young bats that, that uh, hadn't learned how to use sonar very well uh, and put them in the chamber and they never learned to, to capture insects under the new conditions. So it seems like it's an innate um, instinctive aspect of bats that they operate um, using the speed of sound. So when bats are echolocating for insects, they're using speed of sound, not distance, in order to judge where insects are and how fast to fly to catch them. Uh, bat calls are, uh, the reason they're so complex is because they are tonal calls. Uh, they're not a series of clicks. So this is milliseconds of time on the bottom axis, and this is kilohertz on the uh, uh, vertical axis. And what you're seeing here is a single pulse from a bat. Uh, it's happening over about five tenths of a second. It's going from a high frequency of 100 kilohertz down to a little below 20. Humans can hear up to about 20 kilohertz. Uh, so you could, if you have good hearing, uh, if you're young enough, uh, you can maybe hear the bottom end of this bat call audibly. Uh, there's also uh, uh, parts of the sonar call here, uh, which um, are mimics of the original fundamental frequency. These are octaves, and so this allows bats to either gather, even gather more information from the environment. But the pulse itself, and so instead of a series of clicks like it's more like is how they really sound. And so they put a stream of these together, and the what's called this is called frequency modulation gives extremely detailed information from the environment. Uh, in order to produce these calls takes a tremendous amount of energy, and so bats phase it uh, in different pulse rates. So when they're searching for food, they'll pulse more slowly at about 25 times a second. Uh, if they 
see something that looks pretty good and they want to go over and take a closer look, this is called a, an approach phase, and they'll pulse, uh, increase the pulse rate to 50 times a second. And then uh, if it looks good and they get within about a meter of the insect, uh, they'll increase the pulse rate to 250 times in one second uh, in order to get a very detailed uh, description of the insect. This is what that sounds like if it plays. Let's see. Approach phase. Terminal phase. Uh, in terms of how bats capture insects, um, they generally use their membranes to do this. And uh, they don't catch insects in their mouth typically because if you're flying 12, 15, 20 miles an hour, you probably wouldn't want to catch something in your mouth, particularly a beetle. Uh, and so they use the wing membranes to uh, snag the insects and bring them into the mouth. Um, at times they will um, uh, catch them solely in the tail membrane as you're seeing here. Uh, this guy almost does a complete somersault catching an insect. Um, but the uh, wing and tail membranes come in really handy with, with snagging the insects out of the air. Um, this is the type of aerial pursuit that most insectivorous bats use. Uh, there are others that are highly specialized in what's called gleaning behavior. So these bats are capable of hovering, which is the most energetically expensive, difficult type of flight. Uh, and these forest bats uh, generally don't use echolocation to find insects. They have big ears and they listen for the insects kind of fluttering around on the leaves. Uh, and so they move around from leaf to leaf and hover. And then if they hear something, then at the last second, they'll use some echolocation to localize the insect and then just basically jump on top of it, as you see here. Well, you might think bats have all the advantages, but having evolved with insects for at least 52 million years, uh, insects have, have an opportunity to kind of fight back. Uh, and so there are a bunch of insects that have uh, thoracic ears that can hear bats. Uh, they're specially tuned to the echolocation calls of bats. Uh, some of them even have a specialized organ besides the ear membrane. Uh, it's a series of scales they can scrape together in order to generate ultrasound. And this acts as a jamming mechanism to the sonar calls of bats. Uh, and so tiger moths are kind of a, a classic example of this. So you get a bat coming in uh, and the moth freaks out uh, and, uh, you know, generates a, uh, a sound that scares the bat away or makes it think that the insect does not uh, taste well. So sonar jamming is one thing that works. This is the bat generated sonar here and here. This is the moth clicks. That overlap with that sonar uh, and are sent out to try and um, uh, basically uh, uh, jam the echolocation calls of the bats. Uh, the other mechanism is what we call aposomatic. It's a warning signal that uh, I don't taste well. So aposomatic uh, coloration in um, butterflies for example, uh, oranges and reds and blacks. Tell a predator I don't taste well, so don't even try to eat me. Uh, well, you can do that with sound as well. So um, the uh, bat gets a, a signal that uh, the insect does not taste good and you better move on. Uh, so even though this war has been going on for 52 million years and uh, moths have fought back to some degree, your beautiful moths flying around on a, on a hot summer night, this is probably your end. So the bats usually win. Um, the social lives of bats is broad and deep, and we don't have a lot of time to get into this. A lot of it's very new science coming out of the Max Planck Institute where they've developed some really 
innovative experiments to understand um, uh, cognition in bats, uh, socio-emotional uh, aspects of their behaviors, um, and uh, just general and overall sociality. Um, and so we do know the mother-infant bond is, is very tight. As I mentioned, most bats only have one young a year. This is a Mexican free-tailed bat. Uh, and these are all youngsters. They can't fly yet. Most of them are actually still blind. Their eyes are closed. Only one of these is hers. Uh, she was actually left back in the cave to babysit while the other mothers went out to feed. And then somebody will come back and relieve her uh, 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 in a little bit of time. So they keep kind of shifting off and they leave these babysitters in the in the crush of young to make sure they're, they're not misbehaving too badly. Um, young are also uh, born at uh, a very large proportion of mother's body sizes. Um, at the minimum, uh, young are born at 25% at, uh, of the mother's uh, body size. So that would be like a 100 pound woman giving birth to a 25 pound child. Uh, in the worst cases, uh, they're 40%. So that'd be like a 100 pound woman giving birth to a 40 pound child. So um, you can imagine maybe what that might feel like. Um, and so uh, they're born large and fairly well developed. And actually within three weeks from this very infantile state, they will be almost adult size and flying. Uh, with their mothers who teach them how to hunt. Uh, one of the things that came out of Max Planck is that uh, bats form long-term multi-layered friendships. Uh, and so they're very much like elephants, dolphins, and, and uh, non-human primates. Uh, they make these long enduring friendships. Um, and not only that, it's multi-level. Um, in other words, you have very close friends, you have close friends, you have more distant friends, you have acquaintances, um, and bats have all of those levels um, of relationships in their uh, society. Ecological services of bats, um, they do a lot for us. This is just one example of what they do. Um, a colony of 150 big brown bats will annually consume uh, 600,000 cucumber beetles, almost 200,000 June beetles, 160,000 leafhoppers, 330,000 stink bugs. Uh, and so they are extremely important agriculturally. And it's not just what they're eating. So uh, somebody who's good in math did this analysis that a female cucumber beetle lays 110 eggs. Uh, this small bat colony could prevent the production of 33 million cucumber beetle larvae. And so if they're eating females that are full of eggs, that's preventing them laying those eggs and those uh, hatching into adults. And so um, and that's just cucumber beetles. And so the effect is, is, is quite large. And it's not only what they're eating. Studies that have been done in Europe have shown that if you play uh, playback uh, bat sonar calls in the agricultural fields in the uh, crop pests move out of those agricultural fields. And so they're not only consuming insects, but they're moving them. And so they can't sit on crops and just munch them to the ground. Uh, it is estimated that bats save the U.S. agricultural industry about $30 billion annually. Uh, bats also globally do a lot of stuff. Pollination and seed dispersal is, is huge. At least 550 species of 191 genera, 62 families are dispersed by bats in the tropics. Uh, in North America, uh, agave uh, and uh, columnar cactus are pollinated by bats. If you, you like tequila, then you probably like agave. So the next time you have a margarita, thank a bat. Uh, they also pollinate wild banana and again, tons of, of tropical plants. Uh, other services are cultural and ecotourism. If you've been to 
uh, Austin, Texas. Oops, sorry. You've been to Austin, Texas and seen the outflight uh, under the uh, Congress Avenue Bridge. This brings millions of dollars in tourism from people around the world uh, to Austin. It's a huge money uh, sink for them. Uh, bats also are important in population control, so fishing bat, uh, grabbing a fish. Uh, some bats, uh, the larger micro bats, eat rodents, uh, other birds, uh, um, small children. No, just kidding. Uh, and also guano, the dropping of bats is a global economy for many countries, particularly in Africa and also in Mexico, where it is mined as fertilizer. Um, it's the best fertilizer you can buy if you're doing a garden this year. Go to McGuckin's, they sell uh, bat guano uh, fertilizer and uh, put it on your garden and it will explode. So um, just a tip to the wise. Okay, a little bit about bats and viruses. Uh, just a little bit about viruses at first. One thing to remember is that viruses are not alive. So they're non-living organic uh, nucleic acid based molecules. Uh, they're essentially uh, uh, strips of either RNA, maybe which is single stranded or double helical structure DNA. Uh, so the large, large majority is, is RNA. Uh, it's covered covered in a protein coat, uh, which provides a protective layer uh, for the um, RNA and also provides legs uh, and a mechanism by which uh, the RNA can be injected into a cell. So this is a bacteriophage and uh, here's the RNA inside the capsule. It lands and then injects that RNA into the cell uh, it then goes into the nucleus of the cell and takes over the reproduction, what we call mitosis of the cell. And it creates so many copies of itself, that the cell eventually explodes and releases the virus to attack other cells and do the same thing over and over. So for a virus to attack its cell, it has to have a landing site. So there are a lot of viruses everywhere that we'll get into, there are viruses billions of viruses around you all the time. Uh, they're constantly getting into you, but most of them cannot connect to any of your cells and inject their RNA into them. So we are effectively immune. Those viruses haven't evolved to infect you. Uh, coronaviruses, including uh, SARS-CoV-2, which uh, causes um, COVID-19, uh, is prominent in living organisms from microbes to, to mammals. Uh, you've seen this picture, I'm sure. It's a corona a series of um, protein legs. And these are the legs that are going to connect uh, to proteins on your cell and allow for the virus to inject uh, RNA into your cells to take them over. So uh, you can't kill a virus because um, it's not alive to begin with. All you can do is try to control its spread. And it's pretty hard to get rid of viruses because um, uh, they're not alive and they're just in the environment uh, everywhere. Um, bats are commonly blamed for zoonotic diseases, particularly coronaviruses, something that's coming come over in the last 15 years. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, well, bats are immune to many viruses, as it turns out. There are very few viruses that can attach to their cells and infect them. Uh, this is the reason that uh, virologists think that they may be reservoirs, not that they are. Uh, and reservoirs mean that the bats are carrying the virus and actually shedding the virus in their saliva, but they're not being affected by the detrimental effects of the virus. So the virus can infect them cell, their cells, can make copies. The copies go into the bloodstream, eventually get into the saliva, and uh, can get transmitted that way. 
Bats form large colonies that encourage transmission. As you know, during COVID-19, you don't want to be in a large crowd, right? Because transmission is easy when you're close together. Uh, bats fly and can move long distances, so they can move viruses long distance. Uh, people come to, into contact with bats in caves and homes and uh, sometimes eat them. Uh, bats occur in areas where outbreaks happen. Well, bats occur globally, so that's not too surprising. Uh, bats have been known to have antibodies for MERS, SARS, Ebola uh, viruses that infect humans. Um, and so this is kind of important. About 90% of the studies on bats are antibody studies. Uh, antibodies are a reaction to being uh, having a foreign body enter your system. And so if a virus gets into your system, uh, that will alert your um, immune system to attack it, to form antibodies to attack that virus. And so having antibodies does not mean you were ever infected by the virus. It simply means that you were exposed to the virus and your immune system reacted to it. So MERS, SARS, and Ebola uh, are not, uh, those strains that infect humans have not been found in bats. Uh, there have been some uh, strains that are close to what we see in humans. Uh, but it's not nearly the same thing. And in most cases, the bats just have antibodies to being exposed to these viruses. Um, evidence against bats is reservoirs, okay? They've been sampling tens of thousands of bats uh, for over 15 years and, and never, been, never found a bat that uh, is shedding a virus that can infect a human except rabies. And so it's a really important point. Virologists don't like to talk about this much and the media doesn't talk about it at all, uh, but there is no direct uh, link to any zoonosis in humans that can be directly linked to bats except rabies. So if somebody gets rabies, they can uh, isolate that rabies virus and they can tell by the strain whether it came from bats, whether it came from skunks, whether it came from raccoons, because they can trace it directly to the bats are actually shedding that strain of virus, which gets into humans. Uh, that level of um, direct transmission has not been found for anything else. Uh, studies involving many taxa show that zoonosis, and zoonosis is just diseases that can infect humans uh, from other animals. Uh, and studies have shown that when they look broadly at mammals and birds and snakes and all of that, that bats are no more uh, likely to be a reservoir for human diseases than any other species. And in fact, in mammals, ungulates are much more likely, have a much higher incidence um, as do domestic, other domestic animals um, uh, passing disease on to humans. Most of our viruses come from farm animals uh, that we associate with over long periods of time. Uh, despite decades of handling bats unprotected, uh, no bat biologist has ever contracted the disease besides rabies from bats. Uh, and bat biologists have been working on the same species that have been uh, talked about in the media as being the reservoirs of Ebola and all of this, and none of them ever contracted anything. The movement ecology of bats does not track how these diseases are spreading across the landscape. Uh, other species such as pangolins and civet cats have more similar zoonosis patterns to infect humans than bats do. If you don't know what a pangolin is, it's a mammal. It's a scaly mammal in Africa uh, and Asia. <coughs> and uh, these are uh, being wiped out by uh, Asian countries because they're considered medicinal. Uh, they're essentially termite eaters uh, and um, so are very docile and they're very easy to 
uh, collect. And so they're being wiped out at uh, uh, high speeds. They show up in a lot of uh, animal markets in, in China. Okay. Also, virologists do not test broadly for virus organisms. It's almost impossible to do for one, but also it's extremely expensive. And you can't get money from NSF saying, we don't know what an origin is going to be. We just want to sample. Uh, so these are some of the stuff that's come out on bats over the years. 2013, fruit bats harbor more deadly viruses. So the first line of um, information coming out about the dangers of bats were all about flying foxes, the mega bats. Uh, they were the ones because these are the ones that people eat because they're so large, they make a good meal. And people are eating these bats and they're getting Ebola and they're getting MERS and uh, SARS and all of this from these giant fruit bats. Uh, and so in this article, the origin of disease of SARS and Ebola can be traced back to these flying mammals. That is completely false statement. It cannot be. Um, and they have also been implicated in the spread of a new deadly MERS virus. Uh, well, here's an article that came out in 2015. A recent analysis revealed African straw-colored fruit bats, which were the main uh, villain at the beginning, may have evolved to resist the Ebola infections, leading researchers to suggest these bats are an unlikely source of infection responsible for the ongoing Ebola outbreak in Africa. Unfortunately, from a conservation standpoint, the damage has already been done. So megabats didn't work out. So they said, oh, they must be in the microbats then. And so they started surveying microbats. And so they've been focused on bats, 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 and they don't look at other species for the most part. Um, you get articles like this, bat out of hell, Egyptian tomb bat may harbor, harbor MERS virus. Bats host more than 60 human infecting viruses. None of that is true. <laughs> it's never been tracked to bats. Uh, then this came out, MERS virus actually may be coming through Campbell's and Ungulate. Uh, they don't know the origin of these viruses. They're almost impossible to find. If it was in bats, it would be obvious, just like rabies is, and, and we would know. Uh, Think about this, over 100,000 viruses identified in the gut, my, uh, gut microbiome of humans. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with, okay? You touch something, new microbe, new virus, okay? But it's not gonna hurt you. Uh, this recently came out, a uh, new human coronavirus that originated in dogs identified. Now this one actually has been traced to dogs. They are actually shedding the coronavirus that infected some kids and one adult. Um, it didn't, they got a little bit sick. It didn't seem to be a big deal, but that was a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, there's a paper published this year um, by a bunch of uh, bat biologists that also work in uh, bat disease ecology demanding a retraction of several articles published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases uh, that were factually wrong about bats, their ecology, and, and their zoonosis. So anyway, it's been a bit of a uh, struggle from conservation efforts um, to uh, actually educate people about bats. And, and because if you listen to the media, in many virologists, they will immediately say that bats are the source. Um, so for, for COVID-19, there is uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, it's actually SARS-CoV-1, uh, found in bats that's 96% genetically the same as what is uh, causing COVID-19 infection in humans. To put this in perspective, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is 30 kilobase pairs, um, which means it's 30,000 base pairs. Um, a 4% change, which would get it to infect humans, would require a change of 1,200 base pairs uh, in, the, in the strand. Okay, and this would require and the average evolutionary rate of virus is 50 to 100 years for that 
virus in bats to infect a human, even if it even ever went that way, if it even mutated in that direction. Uh, pangolins carry a coronavirus that's 98% similar to uh, the COVID-19 virus, so they're closer, um, and, uh, but still 2% is not good enough. You cannot say that pangolins are the uh, reservoir of COVID-19. Um, so origin of viruses are highly elusive and most remain totally unknown. They test only a few species. They've been focusing on bats for almost 20 years exclusively. Um, cave environments, in my opinion, are the likely source of these viruses. Uh, humans in many tropical areas enter caves. They mine guano. Um, many animals uh, uh, enter these caves as well. And both, and another thing that virologists never consider is that humans might be taking in COVID-19 or other viruses into these cave systems when they're going in the mine guano and actually infecting the bats. Um, but they don't really look at it from that direction. Uh, so humans are likely being exposed to the same viruses of bats in, in these caves. Um, here are uh, 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 guano miners in, in Thailand. They're fully unprotected. Um, anything could be in this uh, cave ecosystem, billions of micros, billions of viruses floating around. Um, and this is what you see in all the virology literature. Um, we start with bats, uh, like it's magic. Okay, bats just, if you asked a virologist, well, where are bats contracting these coronaviruses? They they just ignore you. Uh, so chances are this is where we should be looking in that these viruses are getting into humans and other animals probably from a source point within these cave systems. Some uh, virologists think it's, it's uh, arthropods, uh, possibly insects that are actually um, the uh, reservoirs. Okay, uh, where are we here? All right, I'm going to speed up. So let's get the bats in, in Colorado and particularly uh, Boulder. Uh, so there are uh, 10 species of bats in the county. Uh, most are these myotis bats, which are small and uh, kind of look the same if you see them flying around. Uh, the little brown myotis is the most common uh, in Boulder County. It's a generalist and so can hang out in all kinds of habitats and even houses, gets along with humans uh, pretty well. Uh, the smallest bat in Boulder County is a small footed myotis. Uh, this guy weighs about four grams, uh, has about a four inch wingspan. Uh, so they're just, just tiny. Uh, and uh, they tend to loose the, under rocks on scree slopes and that sort of thing. So if you're ever Walking across scree slopes and stuff, be kind of careful because if you loosen rocks and that sort of thing, you can crush them under there. Uh, the long-eared uh, myotis is a gleaning specialist, so he's talked about gleaning earlier. Uh, these bats fly around in uh, kind of higher elevations, 6,000 feet and above dug fur habitat, and glean uh, moths and beetles off of vegetation. Uh, Friends myotis is also a forage specialist, but they do aerial pursuit in forested areas. And they're called fringe myotis because they have a fringe of fur that comes off the end of the tail membrane here. Hard to see in that picture. Uh, the long-legged myotis uh, is the largest myotis in Colo Colorado. It appears to be very uh, heat intolerant. It comes down... Uh, in uh, May and stays uh, part of June, but then when it starts getting too hot, it moves back up the higher elevation. And in fact, it, with climate change, when we've had these really hot springs, it appears that it is no longer even coming down for a short period of time. Uh, it's remaining at higher elevations. So we're getting 
a climate change induced change in altitudinal migration uh, in this species. Uh, big brown bats are the first bats you see out at dusk. Uh, they come out before it gets dark because they're beetle specialists and most beetles are diurnal. And so the bats will come out and take advantage of a little bit of light left and some diurnal beetles flying around and, and chomp down on them. Uh, they're pretty large. They have about a foot wingspan, so they're pretty large and they tend to forage in figure eight patterns. Uh, so if you're seeing a bat, a large bat flying fast in figure eights, that's definitely a big brown. Uh, hoary bats are the largest bat uh, in the front range. They have about a 16 inch wingspan. Uh, they're kind of like badgers with wings. They're extremely uh, aggressive. In fact, they attack other bats. They're very territorial. Uh, they've been seen taking big brown bats out of the sky and to the ground and actually killing them. Uh, they've been known to eat the smaller myotis bats. Uh, they're very fast flyers. And in fact, hoary bats, as your scenarios are such strong flyers, they are the only endemic mammal of the Hawaiian uh, islands. And so they made it out there on their own. It's pretty impressive. These guys migrate, or so we thought they did. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, silver hair bats are closely related to hoary bats, but they're the, the uh, non evil twin, I guess. Uh, they're very friendly and very nice. Uh, and they're beautiful. They're black with silver hair on their backs, kind of like a silverback gorilla. Uh, they also thought they were migratory and don't hibernate, but we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Uh, everybody's favorite, Townsend's big eared bat with the big ears. These guys are forest specialists that glean off of vegetation. They require very cool caverns uh, in the summertime, and so they're kind of a specialist. There's only about uh, 11 known maternity roosts in the state. And then we have a newcomer, tricolored bats, which uh, are Eastern and actually about 90% of their populations have been wiped out in the East by white nose syndrome. Uh, these guys showed up, uh, actually the first specimen was found in the eighties up, up in Greeley, um, but it was a male. And over the years, one or two has shown up. Are you choking again? But, so funny. but, um, this is a patty. Okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, a couple years ago, uh, a rehabber right. got patty. contact with me and, uh, told me that she had a bat that didn't look like it should be here and which was very astute of her and uh, um, I went and checked it out and as it turns out it was a tricolored bat and it had twins. Uh, so this is the first um, record of reproduction in the state. So we now have reproductive populations here uh, and it turns out they're uh, up in the foothills as well, not only on the eastern plains uh, this individual is found along Boulder Creek, uh, sort of east, east end of Boulder Creek. Uh, and so we have a tenth species here in uh, Boulder County, which is pretty cool. Okay, switching gears a little bit, one of the things we've been looking at uh, is winter ecology in bats. There has been some other studies done of bats being active in the winter. Uh, and we started <coughs> in... Um, 2019, looking, starting to put out sonar detectors to see if bats were active here in the winter. Coincidentally and surprisingly, I got this video from Uli Lipita, um, who is, has trail cams out at Pawnee Grassland. And this was filmed on 21 January. This is all snow. This is a frozen little water hole right here. And uh, she sent this to me and said, you know, I think I have bats flying around. What's going on? Uh, and uh, so I told her, yes, we've been tracking this as well. You can see it coming down and skimming the surface of the ice here. Uh, and as it turns out, whenever 
air temperature is above freezing during the day, these ice patches melt and these bats come out to get water. And so if you watch this one skim the surface, you actually see the water kind of splashing up so the surface has water on it and it's getting a drink. So there's virtually no food to eat, but at least they can get water. Now we used to think that bats went up to high elevation caverns and had to hibernate there. Uh, because it's too dry. They don't hibernate in buildings in Colorado because it's too dry. Uh, and they'll dry out and basically die of dehydration. Uh, but as it turns out, bats can hibernate at these lower elevations in rocks or under rocks on the ground if they're in a situation near a water hole and that water hole melts on uh, days when it's above freezing they can come out and rehydrate by drinking the water. And so uh, here are some graphs. Here are our uh, 10 species. Uh, and this is uh, the frequency of their occurrence. So this is in September and October. And everybody's there, all 10 species. Everybody's happy. Uh, and even in the October, same. Okay, as we're going into November, most of these guys are disappearing and going two high elevation caverns. But here we have small footed myotis, the smallest bat in the front range is persistent. Um, and it's persistent at this site, Ingersoll Quarry at Heil Valley Ranch. Big brown bats are hibernating there along with small footed myotis. But what's really surprising, we're picking up hoary bats, which are supposed to be migratory and silver-haired bats, which are supposed to be migratory and to not overwinter anywhere. Uh, this is going into uh, December, okay? And uh, so again, uh, we got a little bit of activity from fringed and uh, tricolored and evotas. Those might be uh, actually just mislabeled calls. Uh, but these guys are persistent, the uh, small-footed, big brown, hoary bats, silver-haired bats. This goes right through January into February. Um, and then uh, in March, we start to get more individuals coming back. By the end of March, everybody, some individuals of everybody's back. And then by May, it's getting a, a lot more active with over 450 passes a night. Um, at the site. So Ingersoll Car is not only an important site for them in the summer, but it's actually a very important site for bats in the winter time. And of course this changes management because, uh, you know, we, if, people, if managers want to go in and do some mitigation work or um, prescribe burns and that sort of thing, yeah, we always say, well, the bats are gone all winter. Yeah, it's best time to do that sort of thing. Well, they're actually not gone. Uh, in some places uh, that are unique and have water available, bats may be hibernating there. Uh, this is uh, bat activity from uh, the 25th of January through the 7th of February. Uh, the black lines are the, the bad activity. The blue line is temperature. Uh, and, and so you can see how the bad activity more or less tracks temperature, higher temperature, more activity, and then lower temperatures, less activity. Rick, I have a question. Sure. Um, I guess it was previously thought maybe that um, we didn't want to disturb hibernation caves, et cetera, because if they wake up in the middle of the winter or whatever, it uses way too much energy to bring their metabolism up and then they'll die. Yep, that's a really good point. Uh, as it turns out, um, in at least an Ingersoll quarry, there are some insects available, some water emergent insects available. And in fact, in many of the calls, we're picking up that feeding buzz uh, from the bats. So they may be able to get some food uh, that way. Uh, and my guess is that these are probably males uh, only. 
uh, in that they're putting on just uh, you know a ton of fat in the uh, summertime. And they don't have any reproductive effort in the summertime like the females do. And so they can really pile on the, the um, fat and they're getting away with it. So, um, but you are right, particularly uh, in cave systems, uh, disturbing bats is, is a no-no during hibernation. Yeah, good point. So um, gonna talk just so you just have a few slides left, uh, a little bit on climate change. So what we're seeing with climate change is that <coughs> uh, three of the myotas, this is just about the myota species, um, three of them tend to be sort of stable, okay, and maybe the small foot of myotis tends to be increasing a little bit uh, through time, uh, whereas uh, long-legged myotis and fringe myotis are showing pretty dramatic declines uh, in uh, uh, their populations in the front range. And so if these guys are declining, uh, this may allow for uh, these species to increase in numbers. Okay, with myotis volans, uh, which is the long-legged myotis, this is the one that's heat sensitive. And so, as I mentioned, we appear to get a disruption in uh, downhill migration in the spring. So uh, if you look at this line, this is uh, tracking capture data on this species, okay? And this line is uh, June temperatures. And so what you tend to have when the temperature's low, you tend to get more captures of them at lower elevations. Uh, and so this may be the lower numbers that we're seeing at lower elevations may not be population decline, just that they're staying up at higher elevations. But overall, that could affect population numbers as well. With uh, the fringe myotis, it doesn't track temperature in any way. Uh, and so we think this species is definitely declining in Boulder County. Uh, some other effects of this 20 year survey shows that in drought years, some species uh, reduce output by 50%. Okay. Uh, we're also seeing a sex ratio change, which is really quite incredible. Uh, we're seeing a huge trend towards males becoming prominent. Okay, in 2019, only 20% of the captures were adult females. Uh, the mechanisms by which this can happen uh, have been shown in other mammals that stress, whether it's a lack of water availability or on, changes in diet uh, can cause stress in females hey. and can skew sex ratios. In fact, in humans, it's been shown in females that give birth in war zones, they tend to have male young. Uh, or women that have high stress jobs tend to give birth to more male young. And so, um, uh, yeah, a stress factor, whatever it might be, can skew sex ratios in males. Um, the proportion of uh, female juveniles we captured uh, hit their lowest in, in years that uh, are, are uh, have some level of drought from high to sort of moderate levels of drought and uh, loss of water availability for uh, females to be able to lactate milk for their young. Um, what's really kind of interesting, if we look at the temperature and precipitation data over time, we can kind of come up with a, a tolerance curve where the optimal relationship between temperature and precipitation gives a 50-50 sex ratio in bats. And as I mentioned, when it gets too hot and dry, this plummets towards all males in the system. But actually when it's too cold and wet, it favors male offspring as well. So there's kind of an optimal uh, scenario for temperature and precipitation of around 
uh, 29 degrees C and 7.5 centimeters of precipitation in Boulder County, that seems optimal. So too cool and wet, too hot and dry disrupts sex ratio outcomes with too hot and dry having the most uh, skewed effect towards male biased outcomes. Well, uh, we're going to stop with uh, bats and prairie dogs. And uh, this is something, a study I ran a few years ago uh, to look at whether bats are attracted to black tailed prairie dog colonies. So there are uh, three species of prairie dogs that have distributional ranges in Colorado. Um, there's Gunnison uh, up in the mountains, there's whitetail on the western slope, and then on the eastern slope we have blacktails here, and so we're going to talk about blacktail. Uh, the ecology of blacktail prairie dog is very complex and involves hundreds of species. Uh, they are known as ecosystem engineers and they convert um, kind of monoculture grasslands into highly diverse ecosystems uh, by churning up minerals and nutrients and also clearing uh, grasses away, which allow other plants to uh, move in. Of course, if there's more diversity of plants, there's more diversity of animals and it's thought that 250, at least 250 other species are um, uh, present due to uh, black-tailed prairie dogs that would not be there uh, otherwise. So uh, removal of the grasses uh, creates uh, an openness to the system. Uh, uh, bison come into play with this as well. Uh, because they'll come in and wallow in these areas and that sort of thing and break it up even more. Uh, so prairie dog and bison kind of work together to create biodiversity in grasslands. Uh, curiously enough, the saliva of bisons actually promotes um, photosynthesis in plants, whereas the saliva in cows does not. Uh, so cows don't replace bison in the ecosystem. So it creates these islands of biodiversity. Uh, and uh, so looking at bats, the way I set this up is I put sonar detectors in, in, uh, uh, in the middle of uh, black-tailed prairie dog colonies, and then I use reference sites 50 meters outside of these colonies, but the same, same habitat. It's uh, still grassland meadow, but no prairie dog colonies there. Uh, and what we found is that in all four sites, um, some are more active than others, uh, but these are the mean number of passes of bats per night. Uh, at all four sites, uh, Hall is the largest one uh, we sampled um, and had the greatest effect, uh, that uh, bats foraged were much more active significantly in prairie dog colonies than they are outside. Uh, so prairie dog colonies seem to attract bats, and not only that, it varies by species. So our small-footed myotis was by far the most consistently active species in prairie dog colonies. Uh, this species shouldn't be foraging in prairie dog colonies because it's a forest edge species. It really doesn't like to be out in the open. Uh, and so uh, there must be something attracting them there that they really like. Uh, little brown bats, or let's go to long-eared myotis. This is the far specialist, the gleaner. And so they do show up in prairie dog colonies occasionally, but they're more significantly present in the forest or closer to the forest. Uh, little brown bats, which are generalists, uh, were present more in prairie dog colonies uh, as well. Fringe myotis, this again is a, a deep forest specialist. It likes cluttered habitat, does aerial pursuit through Douglas fir forests, but it was significantly more present in prairie dog colonies and outside of those colonies. Uh, the long-legged myotis uh, really was kind of a, a coin toss. Big brown bats forage more in prairie dog colonies. The Townsend's big-eared bat uh, was uh, much more uh, towards the forest than uh, ever in the prairie dog colonies. Hoary bats 
forage more in prairie dog colonies. Silver-haired bats did not. They foraged more outside the perimeter of the colonies than they did inside. Okay, so summary, uh, bats are cool. Um, and they're one of the most unique mammals on earth. They're not gonna get you sick. Um, they're the only true flying mammal. Uh, they're second most diverse order of mammals on earth, credible ecosystem services. Um, they're extremely important to major food webs. Uh, and uh, they're under severe threat of extinction, the whole virus situation. Uh, Merlin Tuttle has been tracking colonies that are getting wiped out in various parts of the world, particularly in Africa after CDC people come in and scare the hell out of people, telling them these bats are carrying Ebola and all of this. So it's been a real conservation nightmare. Um, and we, our bats here are you know, hanging in there, but climate change is accelerating and uh, water seems to be the biggest threat to them, having water availability. Uh, will be a major mitigation strategy as climate change ratchets up. Well, thank you for listening. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, anybody might have. We do have some questions in the chat. Uh, Maureen Ivy, would you like to uh, unmute and ask your question? I'm wondering, Rick, if you have an opinion about why humans fear bats. Certainly there are many myths about bats, but what underlies that? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think in, in most cases when people come into contact, in contact with bats, it's a startling situation. They're not expecting it. Bats not expecting it. Uh, and so it leads and it happens extremely quickly and leads to fight or flight responses, um, which is uh, usually flight. <laughs> um, but um, I just think that the way people interact with bats is rare and uh, just happens in a way that uh, scares them uh, deeply. Uh, and so um, I think that's probably a big part of it. You know, I found that people, you know, I've taken people back at, in the field who hate bats and are scared to death of them. And after a night of, of seeing them up close and personal and how gentle and beautiful they are, they completely change their mind about them. Um, and so I think it's, um, uh, you know, and, and being associated with rabies and now viruses, uh, other viruses is, you know, makes people more fearful of them, uh, that they're, you know, dirty animals that um, are going to get them sick in one way or another. There's another question in the chat from David Burns. David, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Um, other folks, if you want to use your reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can raise your hand in that screen, or you can um, signal us visually that you want to ask a question. So David. Yes, I was just curious whether there have been any impacts on bats due to the controls for West Nile that have been instituted recently. Yeah, it's it's something that I've actually thought a, a lot about, um, you know, just mosquito spraying in general uh, and its effects on the environment is, is uh, quite bad. Um, and it also, because it, 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 it can have the effect of um, killing the, the predators, the natural predators of mosquitoes and actually make things worse. Um, and I was trying to think about how to design a study to see if in areas where they're spraying, whether bats are avoiding those areas or not, but it's just really not possible to find areas for one where they're not spraying except things like organic farms. But I will tell you that, you know, that might be a good analogy. People have done studies uh, uh, for uh, tradition on traditional farms versus organic farms. And the bad activity on organic farms is like 10 times higher uh, than what we see in traditional farms. 
Um, and so that might be um, a kind of a surrogate. It, it may be trying to understand how uh, pesticides and other human activities affect um, uh, whether bats are going to be present in the environment or not. Betty Naughton has a question. Betty, go ahead and unmute. Betty. <laughs> unmute, Betty. <laughs> unmute, Betty. <laughs> I can read lips. <laughs> <You're right>. <laughs> <Talking> <laughs> <away>. <laughs> it's always good to see you and hear you talk about bats, and you have turned me into such a bat lover. <laughs> but, <laughs> and did you, maybe you said this when you were talking about it, and I, I zoned out for a minute, but did, did you say why you think that some of the forest specialists hang out in prairie dog colonies? Yeah, um, that's the that's the million dollar question. Um, it's probably it's probably food source, and so um, you know we do have data on uh, guano dietary analysis of, of bats in Boulder County, and we do know that uh, there have been some studies. Actually, been incredibly few. I was shocked at how few studies of insect diversity. Hmm. Uh, in, uh, studies of insect diversity in prairie dog colonies have, have been done, almost none. There's been about two or three. And most of these are looking at, at ground, ground insects, not... Uh, yeah, flies. I just think of fleas, you know, as being an insect in a prairie dog colony. So, but from, just from those studies, prairie dogs increase, uh, in particularly beetles, uh, in their colonies and small mm -hmm. foot myotis eat a lot of small beetles, mm -hmm. eat a lot of flies too. Um, so I suspect uh, they, you know, of all the species, um, even uh, outperforming the open aerial bats that should be there, uh, the small footed myotis are um, consistently there in high numbers when there's a prairie dog colony nearby. And so it's probably food. Now, another possibility is that they might be using abandoned prairie dog burrows as roost sites. Mm -hmm. uh, very hard thing to figure out. Prairie dog burrows are very complex. Um, it would probably have to be abandoned ones, uh, but it is possible because when I look at the sonar data, there's a burst of activity right after emergence time and then the activity dies off and then in the early morning about four or five o'clock the activity of small footed myotis really picks up mm -hmm. it's exactly what the roost site <laughs> um, and we look at the other myotis species and it's just the opposite it's really low activity at emergence time and it builds up throughout the night and then tapers off mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> um, I haven't figured out a way to figure out if they're using prairie dog burrows as, as uh, roost sites, but it's a possibility that they might be doing that. We know they roost under rocks on the ground all the time or under tree trunks. Um, so they're, they're used to being on the ground. It's not uncommon for them to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Leslie has a question. Leslie, go ahead. Um, I live in the riparian area in the foothills, and um, we used to have quite a few bats. They seem to be disappearing, so I've been trying to figure out um, where to put a bat house. <laughs> I put one under the front porch where they were. They seem to be every now and then, and nothing happened. So I moved it to the back, under the back porch facing west, and towards the pond, and they don't seem to be going in. Um, do you have an idea? Yeah, um, definitely for a bad house, you want to have it out on a pole in the open, uh -huh. uh, about 15 feet up, okay. where it catches the early morning sun. Uh, you know, Bat Conservation International website has tons of information on how to, to put bat houses up. The bats that are using your porches, they're using that as a night roost, not a day roost. And so they'll hang under there. They'll go out and forage. They'll leave the day roost, go out and forage for a couple hours. Then they'll find an overhang to go to sleep for a while and digest that food. And then 
uh, they'll, uh, after digesting that food, they'll wake up in a few hours and go out and forage again, and then go back to the day roost, which is a crevice of some sort. And so you want to get it up uh, off the ground on a pole, if you can. Dead trees work pretty well, but on a pole, it's going to be something new in the environment. They're going to want to check out anyway, so it may attract them. Uh, but it needs to get to a particular thermal environment inside. It needs to get over 100 degrees in there early in the morning. So it has to catch the earliest morning sun and stay sunlit at least through half the day. Well, down in the valley, I don't know in the morning it's ever going to get that warm, but... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> if you if you face it, uh, if you face it towards the early rising sun, it'll heat up in there. Okay, thank yeah. you. But that Conservation International website is wonderful. They have all kinds of ideas and clues about how to best get bats into your house. Okay. Bat house. <laughs> thank you. Deb, Deb Karstensen, unmute and ask your question. Hi, I, I made a note that I had a bat come out to the pond that I live on, which is aerated, so it kept partially open in the winter. And it was about 16 degrees or so. And I couldn't figure out what the heck. At first I thought it must be a swallow. That's not right either. And then huh. I realized it was a bat. And I'm just curious, uh, what type of bat most likely would I have in kind of in the suburbs of Littleton? Probably big browns, yep. And, and that would be true kind of generally, if big browns are what I would be having here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, little browns and big browns, they have the kind of similar common name, but they're ecologically very different. But one thing they do have in common is that they will coexist with humans uh, in houses and, and other buildings. Most bats will avoid any buildings that are occupied by humans. And so uh, it's one of those two. And you can tell them apart because little brown's tiny and the big brown is about a foot wingspan. And, oh pretty obvious and and where do you it was see perhaps roosting or in someone's home or um under the bark of a tree as you mentioned before uh what time of year was this february wow okay well it must be in a rock somewhere because it, it's only rocks that are going to take that diurnal heat from the sun uh and uh maintain it overnight. Uh, it can't go below freezing or it will kill the bat. Um, they'll you know, they get uh, hypothermia just like anybody, any other mammal. Um, that's that's so interesting. Their roost has to remain above freezing. In houses, um, uh, you know, there, I did get a call from uh, the Boulder um, uh, Power uh, company uh, over, um, uh, you know, the natural gas site in Boulder off of uh, Folsom uh, with a, they had a bat flying around in, in February. Mm. Uh, but the water there is heated and melted. And so the bat must have found something that stayed above freezing uh, that they could roost in. And then there was drinking water because of the discharge from the um, power plant kept the water open all winter. Okay, so from what you're saying, it doesn't sound like big or little brown bats mostly stay here in the winter then usually. Yeah, little browns appear to have to find underground caverns up in the mountains. Okay. Uh, we didn't pick them up at all at the quarry uh, overwintering there. Um, and so most of the species, you know, is like we thought it was. But uh, with big browns and the small-footed myotis in particular, those two seem to be able, seem to have figured out a way to hibernate in places we didn't think they could. Okay, thank you. Okay, just one other thing on this, this winter ecology stuff. I should say that um, 
OSMP, so Will Keeley uh, and Ryan have been putting bat detectors out in the winter as well in Bear Creek Canyon has uh, very similar activity, over winter activity to, to what we're seeing out at in your saw quarry. Um, so there are pockets uh, where this is going on. It's not just unique to that one site. So uh, you may see bats flying around in the winter in Bear Creek Canyon if you're hiking out there at night. <laughs> I'll use that as a segue to pick up Will's question. Will, you want to unmute and ask your question? And then we'll get you, Deborah. <laughs> hey, Rick, this is kind of on Deborah's question. How are you? Good. How you doing? Good. Thanks for doing so many things for bats. We really appreciate it. No. Um, two things. One, one was kind of on Deborah's, um, or Melissa, sorry, um, white nose syndrome in New Mexico. What do we have to look out for now that it's been confirmed in New Mexico? And the other was we're, we're um, rerouting the Royal Arch Trail and through a bunch of talus. And so our trails folks, and, and maybe this is just for OSMP, but maybe other, other folks would benefit from hearing it, but you know, they like to push grade in talus, which means 16% you know, grade, and they're moving around rocks. Is there any data on what sized um, talus, what sized rocks these little browns and big brown males have been found under? Um, yeah, in, in those areas, you know, you're, it's probably going to be mostly small footed myotis that are using those. In the ones I've radio tracked, um, uh, they're under fairly large, larger rocks um, because it provides some thermal buffering because the scree scopes tend to be out in the open and it can easily get too hot. So um, we found them under mostly large rocks, but I will tell you one night, <clears throat> this is out at, uh, uh, on county property out near Hall Ranch, we were setting a net and one of my graduate students bent down to pick up a rock to, uh, to help support the pole. And there was a small footed uh, myotis underneath that rock and the rock was only that, that thick and about that round. Um, so I think it can, can vary a lot seasonally, uh, this time of year when it's not that hot, they might be under thinner stuff. And mm. so, yeah, I'm not sure I could, uh, say, um, I hadn't heard about the New Mexico thing. Um, yeah, I just got a BLM noti notification that they had confirmation of PD and Cave cave bats in New Mexico, in Lincoln County. Is it just PD, or did they actually find white nose syndrome? They confirm confirm the fungus too. Okay, but not not the syndrome. Unknown. I can send you the information for sure, but yeah, it was it was but something. Sites around where the fungus has been found. It's been found in Wyoming, for example. Yeah. The disease has not showed up at all. Um, so, <laughs> don't know what else to say except. <laughs> yeah, I know, I hear you. But I mean, let's, you know, just as a quick follow up, um, Townsend's don't seem to be that susceptible to the disease. Is that accurate? Um, <clears throat> I don't know of it in, in Townsend's at all, um, or it's, uh, you know, Rafeskii, which is uh, sort of the um, sister species back east. I have not seen any data that um, uh, has shown it in, in those populations. Okay. So I, I don't know of the syndrome showing up in them at all. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but um, for most of those colonies, uh, you know, people, uh, they don't usually form really large colonies in, in cave systems like many of the other Eastern species. So they're much harder to track um, and know what's going on because they form a lot of smaller individualized sites kind of like they do here. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, I hear you. So just one quick follow up then. So I know Colorado Parks and Wildlife didn't allow handling of bats last year because of COVID. I have they relaxed those restrictions in 2021. From what I heard, they're taking it on a case by case basis. So I, I put in for a trapping permit. And I guess one of these days I'll hear something back. Um, <laughs> You know, they claim 45 days it takes um, the process permits because they send them out for review and stuff. So um, it hasn't been 45 days yet. I think it's probably getting close to 30. Okay. Um, Great. So I'll fingers let crossed. You know. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. All right. Last question, Deborah. Hi, Rick. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, it's sort of a follow-up to the, the white nose syndrome question. Is, is there any concern with the tricolor bat migrating from the east, uh, bringing that out? That's certainly something I've thought about. Um, so yeah, it is, it is possible. And um, what's, what's been interesting about them, so since 2017, when reproductive female was found uh, in 2018. I've been tracking them at Twin Lakes and also at Walden Ponds. Huh. Uh, they've been, you know, from 2018 to 2019, it was a modest increase in, in activity and I assume individuals. <clears throat> 2019 and uh, 2019, it just, uh, in 2020, just exploded. Uh, I mean, like, you know, by order of magnitude, like three times, four times as many sonar call recordings of them. And so I don't think they could reproductively get there, even though they twin, like most bats here do not. Um, but so far, they're still twinning here. Uh, so even with that and high survivorship, um, I, I don't think they could just you know, explode like that unless other individuals were migrating in as well. Um, so I think it's probably both things are happening. <clears throat> and yeah, it's a concern that they could bring uh, the fungus here because um, they are hibernating here. Uh, I did check out a, a mine on private property uh, up in um, uh, uh, kind of uh, just outside of, of Boulder perimeter here. Uh, and uh, there was a, a tricolored bat that owners on the property had photographed hibernating there. Uh, it was by, by itself. And one thing about them is they tend to be solitary. Hmm. They don't form large colonies, but um, uh, yeah. So they are hibernating here, obviously. Uh, they could be in with other bats, uh, and so it is a concern. Thanks. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks so much, Rick. We really appreciate it. You're great going talk. To I'm just getting started. That's right, and people have to get up for the eclipse this morning, too, oh, so we got right. a busy night. I'm going to do that, too. <laughs>